It is so good to be with you guys this morning. Thanks so much for taking time out of your week to join us. As always, it is such an honor and a privilege to share in this time together, not just in this time together, but for us to share just in whatever journey you're on, just to share a couple miles or a couple steps together. Uh, it just means a lot to us, and we just appreciate to be a part of your journey in however small a way or big a way that might be. Uh, we are continuing a conversation that's been a long conversation because they're the kinds of conversations we tend to have here at Key City, long conversations. Um, something that we started back in June, the beginning of the summer, and what we've been talking about stems from this recognition, recognition that there is this common thread, there is this theme that runs through the narrative of Scripture, this theme around trust, that the thing that we find God wanting to build with his creation is trust. There is this open invitation into trust with God that throughout his relationship with Israel, God was trying to teach them to trust him, that he would provide for him, that he would care for them, that he would give them guidance that was for their best. He was trying to get them to trust him. And then when God walked onto the pages of history and the person of Jesus, his invitation was, trust me, trust me, trust me. Or as we often read it translated in, in our Bibles, it's translated as faith or belief. Put your faith in me or believe in me. It all equates to trust me, have confidence in me that I'm not going to lead you astray. That if you follow me, it's going to be okay. We just see it throughout Scripture. And that trust, trust is this central thing that when trust is restored, it is the thing that leads to our restoration, that it's trust in God that allows us to become who God originally created us to be, people created in the image of God, that we are all image bearers of God, that within you, within me, is planted the image of God. Of God, And so often trust, this thing of trust or this thing of faith, however we might want to term it, this thing of trust is so often treated as like just a switch that we flip, that we go from not trusting and then we flip the switch and then we trust. But for those of us who've been on this journey with God, we know that it doesn't quite work that way. It's not quite a switch that we flip, but as Jesus described it, it's more of a seed that grows. And that seed, that seed, which is the image of God within us, grows from this condition of trust. That as we cultivate an internal condition of trust, the result is, the most natural thing in the world is, that the image of God within us becomes apparent. That we begin to express from us the goodness and the love of God. And, and so we spent a lot of time talking about how do we cultivate those internal conditions of trust. And what we've recognized through since, since June, what we've recognized is that trust is something that we develop over the long term. Trust is something that we cultivate and grow over the long term. But trust is something that we're also invited to learn to cultivate and to exercise in the moment to moment and the day to day. Kind of like any point of character, as we've said over and over again, the same way that we grow, patience. Patience is a capacity that we can grow over the long term, but it comes from practicing and learning to practice patience in the moment to moment. In the same way, trust grows, our capacity for trust grows over the long term, but it comes from learning to trust in the day to day and in the moment to moment. Um, I just realized this terrifying thing, I feel like... Those dreams you have, right, where all of a sudden you realize you have to give a speech in front of your class and you look down and you don't have any clothes on, then for some reason your teeth fall out. Like, that's what I'm experiencing right now because my whiteboard's not here and I just feel exposed <laughs> and vulnerable. Whoo, now we're okay. Now we're safe. And the most terrific thing, I don't know if these are the old markers or the new markers, since our, uh, our, our uh, whiteboard failures of a little while ago, since then, we've just had dry erase markers just showered upon us. Just showered upon us. Um, it's been incredible. 
Um, so we've been talking about trust. Capacity grows over the long term when we exercise it in the moment to moment, day to day. And so the question that we've been asking is, how do we trust in the moment to moment, day to day? Like, what does trust look like in the moment to moment, day to day? How do we do that? And so that's what we've been talking about. And we started, this has been, we've been building. Maybe you didn't know it. Maybe we didn't explain it well enough. But we've kind of been building from the beginning blocks that, that you'll see, hopefully, how they all stack on top of each other and connect together. And where we started this was, I'm going to go over here, where we started this was with this practice of self-awareness, that, that learning to trust in the day-to-day and the moment-to-moment starts with the practice that becomes a habit, that becomes a just what we do of self-awareness. And we offered just a really simple tool for growing in self-awareness, and that tool was the line, and we recognize at any point in time, at any point in time, we're either above or below the line, that self-awareness is just being able to locate at any point in time where we are, if we're above or below the line. We said they're diametrically opposed. When we're above the line, we're in a state of trust. We're in a state of openness. We have connection with our cognitive capacities for Connection and creativity and curiosity and compassion, like all of the things that are related to becoming more like Christ. When we're below the line, we're in a state of fear, we're a state of contraction, we're closed, we're reactive, we're defensive, we might experience it as shame or as guilt or as anger, but all of that is below the line in this state of fear. And that self-awareness is just growing our capacity to just recognize at any point in time, are we above or below the line? And as we've seen, the more we grow in self-awareness, the more we grow in self-awareness, the more we become aware of how often we're not where we really want to be. Like, we find out, like, more frequently than not, we're in a more contracted, reactive, below-the-line condition. And we recognize what more often than not, maybe even 100% of the time, what drives us into that condition is when reality is other than we'd want it to be. When life doesn't show up the way that we want it to show up. When people don't meet the expectations that we have for them. Or when we fall short of the expectations that we have for ourselves. That when reality is different than how we would want it to be, we find ourselves in the state of defensiveness, of reactivity, and in resistance. And so self-awareness just brings our attention to that. And then we spent the second month talking about, well, what do we do with that when we become aware of that? And we said that the antidote, the antidote to that resistance to reality as reality shows up is acceptance. So shifting above the line, it starts with self-awareness, Mm. I bet I can spell it. Self-awareness. And self-awareness brings our attention to what needs our acceptance. It makes us aware of the realities that we need to accept, that we're shifting from a state of resisting reality to a state of allowing reality to be just as it is is self-awareness brings our attention to what needs our acceptance. And as we practice this, as we take these and make them practices, and those practices become habits, and those habits just become patterns for how we walk around in our day-to-day lives, what these things do is they move us directionally. They're moving us directionally from an internal state of fear to an internal state of trust. Self-awareness, just by itself, just that ability to notice when you are in a state other than trust, safety, and openness, just noticing that and being able to name it begins to move us back to, begins to directionally shift us back into a calm, open state of trust. 
They've done MRIs on this. They've, they've looked, done uh, like brain scans where they've had people, they, they've instigated a certain brain state like fear, anxiety, anger, frustration, and then they've had the subjects name what they were experiencing. This is what's so fascinating about it. 100% of time, it decreased the brain activity that was associated with that state. Like 100% of the time, it decreased how intensely they were experiencing that emotion when they just named it. Self-awareness reduces that intensity of this state of fear. It begins to shift us back into a state of trust, just naming it and accepting it. Accepting it. It's like the horror movies, right, where like, you know there's something that's killing everybody, but you don't really know what it is, and it's so terrifying until you see it, right? And they don't show the movie monster until the end of the movie because once you actually see it, it's just not that scary anymore. Have you ever noticed that? Like in Jaws, like the shark was so scary, but then when you saw it like on the boat, it's like, that doesn't even look real. It's just not that scary anymore. Like acceptance is taking this reality that we're resisting and we're just confronting it. And when we confront it, it further shifts us back into this state of trust. There was a mystic who once described it uh, that our resistance to reality is like getting shot with two arrows, right? That the first arrow is life happening other than the way that we want it to happen, right? That causes us this initial suffering. That's the first arrow. The second arrow is our resistance to that reality. And the first arrow chooses us, but we choose the second arrow. We can choose other than that. And instead of resisting reality, accepting reality. Now, we accept reality. We're moving directionally into the state of trust. Hmm. But here's the really hard thing that we all discover when we make this shift to accept reality is that we don't like it. And now, once we've confronted it, now we've said, like, this is reality, and it's like, what do we do with it now? Like, once we've confronted it, what do we do with it? What do we do with the reality that we accept when we're looking at it with clear eyes, when we're not backing down from it, when we just choose to confront it? What do we do? Because, because this thing, this reality that we're confronting, this thing we tend to see as a barrier, that stands between us and what we want. It's showing up and it's preventing us from being happy. It's preventing us from being successful. It's preventing us from having the relationship that we want to have. It's preventing us from, you know, making the moves or the changes that we want to make. It's preventing us from getting to where we want to go. So what do we do with this thing that just seems like a barrier that's getting in the way of where we want to get. So that's what we're going to be talking about this month. We're talking about two shifts so far. The shift from autopilot to awareness. And the shift from awareness, from resistance to reality to acceptance of reality. And then once we're confronting reality, we're going to start talking about this third shift that we're going to learn to make together. Now, what makes this third shift so difficult is because our entire lives, it's been taught out of us. Like this third shift is what we were born just doing naturally. But throughout our lives, we've been untaught this. And even in our faith communities, often, maybe in the version of faith that you initially grew up in or the version of faith that you were initially handed, perhaps in that version of faith, you were untaught this. Because in many faith communities, your belonging in that community is based on your beliefs and your behaviors. That there are things that you have to Believe, and there are ways that you have to behave in order to belong. That there is this expectation. There is someone you have to be to belong in the community. And so, so, the expectation is that you would be this person, that you would be 
something. And the result is faith becomes equated with being a certain way. Now, when Jesus walked onto the scene, that was the religious system in legalistic Judaism that was prevailing in the context that he walked into. That the Jewish expectation was for people to be a certain way. That to be one of them, you had to believe a certain way and you had to belong, uh, you had to behave a certain way in order to belong in the community. That you had to be a certain way. But Jesus invitation completely shatters that expectation. Now you'll remember, if you've been around church, if you've sat in church, you, you've heard these stories. We can remember when Jesus called his first disciples or students, we'll unpack that word a little bit more here in a moment. When Jesus went to his first disciples and he found these fishermen, right? They'd just come back from a night of fishing, and they were on the beach, and they were washing, and they were cleaning their nets, and Jesus went to them, and he invited them to do what? Be like me, right? He said, be like me. Stop being like you, and now be like me. None of you remember that from Scripture, right? Because that's not what he said. He didn't say, be like me, that you were being like this, now be like this. Instead, he said what? He said, follow me. I am inviting you, not to be a certain way, but I'm inviting you to follow me. And the invitation to follow me was common in that day in rabbinic Judaism, was a common invitation from a rabbi to selected students. And the idea was that those students would become followers or mimickers of their rabbi, that they would learn the customs of their rabbi. They would learn to see the world through the eyes of the rabbi. They would learn the teachings of the rabbi. They would learn to live like the rabbi. Often the students of the rabbi were said to be covered in the dust of the rabbi because it was this picture of them walking so closely and mimicking so closely the life of the rabbi that they'd just be covered in the dust of the rabbi. Jesus was inviting them not to be something like Prove to me that you believe like me, not prove to me that you behave like me, but an invitation not to be something, but to become someone. Inviting them not to prove something, but into a process of becoming, a process of learning, of growth, this, this student learning, humble growth and learning process. And throughout Jesus' ministry, we find Jesus reiterating this over and over again, right? We remember when he went to Matthew, who was sitting at the tax collector's booth. Matthew, who was just a traitor to his nation, and Jesus approaches him, and his disciples are staying off to the side because they don't want to have anything to do with Matthew. And Jesus goes to Matthew, and he says, Matthew, be just like me. No, he says, follow me, inviting you into a process. And when Jesus you know, predicted his death and resurrection. Remember, Peter pulled him aside and was like, no way, this will never happen to you. Da, da, da. And Jesus was like, you know, out of my way, Satan. Like, you don't have in mind the things of God, things of man. And then he turns to the crowd and he says, anyone that would come after me would have to take up their cross and be just like me now, but to follow me, to engage in this process, not of proving who we are, but becoming who we were created to be a process of growth and learning and discovery. And as Jesus approached Jerusalem, knowing that his arrest, his crucifixion was imminent, as he was approaching Jerusalem, he would still turn to the crowds and he would still turn to the people and say, follow me. I'm inviting you into this process of learning and becoming, of being a student, learning from me. And then the night before he would be crucified, as he sat around with his closest disciples or students. He painted out what it meant to be a student of Jesus. A student of Jesus. Not a student of the Bible. 
Bible's not bad, but not a student of the Bible, not a student of theology, and theology's not bad, but not a student of theology, not a student of doctrine, and doctrine's not bad, but not a student of doctrine, not to be a disciple of Bible doctrine or theology, but to be a disciple of Jesus. Jesus says, here's what this looks like. As I have loved you in the same way that you've seen me loving you, so you must love one another another. Mimic my love. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples. We're students, the ones who are learning from me, the ones who are engaged in this process of growth and discovery, if you love one another. That this is the mark of being a disciple, a student, someone who's learning from Jesus that we are in a process of learning and growing to love just like Jesus loved. And the reason I'm spending so much time underscoring and emphasizing this is because the word disciple has taken on a meaning in the church that is so unhelpful and is creating so many issues, in my personal opinion, by equating it to learning Bible facts. Bible facts that are then held up as the standard of this is who is in and this is who is out. That you learn the Bible facts and you agree with the Bible facts and you defend the Bible facts. When Jesus says, no, are you loving like me? That is the hallmark. That is what I'm inviting you into. This is what I'm wanting to to learn and to grow in. Jesus would go to the cross. He'd come back to life just like he said that he would, and he'd pull his disciples together before he ascended into heaven, and he'd said, listen, go and make students, disciples, followers, people who are in a process of becoming, of learning, little by little, step by step, inch by inch, learning to love just like me. Jesus, Jesus' invitation was not about proving something, proving that we have the right beliefs, proving that we have the right behaviors. It wasn't about being something, but becoming someone, becoming who God created us to be, engaging in a process of growth for the image of God that is planted inside of you to become manifest through you. Jesus is inviting us into process, this growth process. And his, his disciples, the 11, they knew this. They understood this. Jesus' first century followers, they knew this, that, that this was a break from legalistic Judaism and having to prove that we believe and behave and entering into this growth process of learning, of curiosity, of discovery, of failure, this process of becoming. They knew this. They also knew that entering into this process of growth, discovery, the process wasn't going to spare them from the challenges and the struggles and the difficulties and the tensions and the traumas and the tragedy of our day-to-day walking around lives, that it wouldn't be a walk through the rose garden, right? Because they'd seen Jesus crucified. (laughs) And if Jesus, who demonstrated the way of love to them, could still face that tragedy, they knew that they wouldn't be spared either. They knew that following Jesus was going to be following Jesus on a path that is still filled with the same struggles and challenges that everybody else faces. And maybe, maybe, nobody knew this better than a man named Paul. Paul, who was a first century follower of Jesus, who was persecuting followers of Jesus until on his way to put followers of Jesus in prison, he met the resurrected Jesus, and Jesus invited Paul to follow him into this process of growth and becoming to learn to love just like him. And Paul became this influential follower of Jesus who planted communities of followers of Jesus throughout the Mediterranean. And during that time, 
Paul's missions throughout the Mediterranean, during that time, Paul faced horrendous challenges. He was hunted down. He was put in prison. He was beaten. At one point, they thought he was dead and threw him out into a pile of corpses, but he wasn't dead, and he just went right back into the city again. Paul, who was starved, who was, was shipwrecked. I mean, Paul, as a follower of Jesus, faced challenge and struggle and tragedy over and over again. Yet Paul, who we learned from previously, who said that he had learned to be content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry. He had learned the secret to being content. Paul didn't shy away from confronting tragedy. It didn't bother Paul's understanding of the goodness of God. He didn't just pain over it. He didn't just skip by it. But Paul confronted the difficulties, the tragedies, the hurt and the pain, and confronted it head on. And here's how Paul looked at it. Here's the perspective that he shares with us. This is what Paul did when he came to this place of this is what reality is and was looking reality in the face. This is what Paul understood. Here's what he said, or what he wrote, actually. That here's what we know. We know this. He's like, I've been living this out. I've been experimenting on myself, and we know this. We know that in all things, all the things, the difficulties and the trials and the people that you thought you could rely on and realize that you can't, when life doesn't work out the way that you thought it should, when you lose that thing, when you lose what you thought you had, when you realize that you aren't who you thought you were, when you make that mistake, in all things, Paul says, in all the ways that reality shows up other than we want it to be, in all things, God works. God is at work. Those things that are so difficult, those things that are so challenging, those struggles that you go through where you wonder, where is God? Paul saying, God is there. God is at work in those things. How? Why? For the good who love him. That God is working through the struggle. He's working through the challenges. He's working through the things that we find ourselves having to confront that we don't want to confront. Paul says, God's working there for your good. He said, what good? Paul says, listen. For the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. There is a purpose that God is working through these things. What is the purpose, Paul? Because those God foreknew, he also predestined. God had a process in mind, a developmental process in mind that we would be conformed to the image of his son. That through our challenges, that through our difficulties, through our hardships and disappointments, that God is at work to produce the image of Christ in us, that through those things we would learn to live and love just like Jesus, that Jesus might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. That when Jesus invites us to follow him, He then steps out into our lives, into our pain and into our hurt and into our struggles and into our disappointments and into the people's lives who have hurt us. He walks into all of it and says, follow me here. Follow me here. And he waves us into those challenges and struggles and difficulties. And he promises, because I am going to develop something in you here. If you follow me through this, I'm going to grow something in you that I couldn't develop in you otherwise. I'm going to teach you something that you couldn't learn otherwise. I'm going to develop capacity in you that couldn't be developed 
otherwise. I'm going to reveal to you something of myself that you couldn't have learned anywhere else. I'm going to teach you my sufficiency. I'm going to grow in you my grace. And as you follow me through the challenge and the struggle, this, the image, my image, that is planted in you is going to become manifest. You are going to begin to live and love just like me. Our challenges, in other words, Paul says, our challenges that we often see as the barriers between us and what we want, our struggles and disappointments that so often seem to be in the way of what we wanted God's purposes to be, in the way of our happiness, in the way of the success that we want, or in the way of the relationships we want. Paul says, no, our challenges aren't a barrier to what we want. Listen, <laughs> they're the path, your potential that the way towards your becoming like Christ, to love like Christ, is through the things that we find ourselves having to accept. And so as we shift from autopilot to self-awareness, and as we then shift from resistance of reality acceptance of reality. Paul is inviting us to shift our perspective, perspective or to a perspective of growth, and development, and curiosity. That self-awareness brings attention to what needs our acceptance. Whatever it is that we accept, those uncomfortable realities that we have to look in, those, in the face, whatever we accept, the chance to move toward our best. That if God is as good as he's revealed himself in the person of Jesus, if he really is that good, he will not allow us to go through anything that he won't use redemptively. Meaning, the way that we show up in life, the way that others show up in our lives, the way that life shows up, it's all part of this developmental curriculum that Jesus is inviting us to follow him through because as we do, we develop into his likeness. Their entire lives are the gymnasium for our soul. Their entire lives are the perfect curriculum for us to learn to become and to love just like Jesus. So that whatever life brings, however we find ourselves, however other people disappoint us, However reality breaks down, Jesus invites us, follow me through because I'm going to grow something in you through this. Now, this can be so easily misunderstood. It can be misunderstood as God is causing this. We're not saying that God is causing these circumstances. And it can be heard as, well, since God is working here, just cheer up. It'll all be fine. We're not saying that either. And it can so easily be heard as like, well, God is doing something here, so just suck it up and push through and deal. We're not saying that either. God is not causing these things. God welcomes the full range of emotion in, in response to these things. We're also recognizing that God is committed to working redemptively and restoratively in the midst of these things. Even in the midst of the greatest tragedies of life, it's so hard to comprehend in the moments when we're going through them. When we feel like we've lost so much and we can't see any good in it, when we get to the other side and look back on those seasons, we would never choose it. We would never choose to go through it again. We're not even glad that we went through it, and we wouldn't wish it on anybody. But we can look back on those seasons and know something was developed in me there that never could have grown otherwise. 
I've learned something experientially through that that other people only know theoretically. I've come to a deeper intimacy with God experientially that other people will only know theoretically. I've come to know the sufficiency of God experientially in ways that other people will only ever know theoretically. Because in those situations, in all things, God is at work the good of those who love Him. So as we grow in self-awareness, and our self-awareness brings attention to what needs our acceptance, ever those things are that we accept, ever they are, they're a chance, they're a path towards our best, greater capacity for love, for grace, for intimacy with God. This shifts our mindset that is so often in our day-to-day -day lives when we face the challenges and the difficulties and it just feels like life is happening to us, that we're these victims of reality. What we're talking about here, this movement, this shifting, this changing the entire way that we approach life and learning to see all of our circumstances to see the people that we encounter, to see the things that we have to go through as developmental, as growth opportunities, as this soulish development into Christ-likeness. That, that, that is the posture of trust. We're walking through life with open arms, rea welcoming reality just as it shows up, recognizing that through all of it, God is at work to grow us and develop us likeness of his son. How do we do this? For all of these, we've, we've consistently talked about how do we turn this into a practice that becomes a habit, habit, that becomes a pattern, that just becomes how we live and walk through life. So let's walk through this again. The first is just developing the habit, the practice of self-awareness just throughout our days, and we've talked about this before, throughout the days, being able to check in with ourselves and ask ourselves the question, where am I in this moment? Where am I? Above the line or below the line? Just where am I? And from that place, practice acceptance. That if we can locate where we are, then we ask ourselves the question, am I willing to accept myself there? A little reactive, a little defensive. Can I accept myself there? And then, what reality do I need to accept in this moment? What do I just need to non-judgmentally, non-reactively, I just need to allow it to be? And then from that place of just being able to confront non-judgmentally, non-reactively reality, just to ask ourselves, am I willing to be open to how God is wanting to work here? Instead of resisting this, and feel like this is happening against me? Can I just open myself to the possibility that God is doing a work here in me, through me, and for me? Can I just be open to that? That is the posture of a student. That is the posture of a disciple. Be open to what it is that God wants to put in us, to build in us, to impart to us. Don't mistake this. This is what I would do. Don't mistake this with analyzing what you're going through to figure out exactly what it is that God is wanting to teach you. That's not bad, and there's time and place for that. But often that un can, can inadvertently undo what God is inviting us to into. It's not analyzing to figure out what God is teaching us, but is a posture of openness to receive what God is wanting to impart to us through these seasons. And as we do this, if you actually built these practices into your lives, if you actually made this a day-to-day, moment-to-moment, walking around in your life habit, the way that you step into your life, the way that you show up in your life changes. 
how you engage in your life changes from being resistant to life and reality to re recognizing this is showing up for me. There's something for me to grow through here. This is some, there's something for me to learn here. And the difficult relationships, recognizing there's something for me to learn in this relationship here. And the job difficulties to recognize there's something for me to grow here. And the family struggles, there's a capacity that God is developing in me here. <laughs> and it reinforces a greater desire than just our happiness or our peace or our joy. This greater desire for Christ-likeness. Become the people who live and love just like Jesus. But that becomes our heart's desire. Because, we say, every single week, and hopefully you've learned this by now, you are the light of the world, the image, the image of God is planted in you. God's desire is for that image to be manifest and expressed to the entire onlooking world. You would learn to love just like Jesus, and that only comes, is only developed trials, the struggles, and the difficulties as we follow him. Will you guys pray with me? God, we are so grateful for you. So grateful for your consistent presence in our lives. Through the challenges, through the struggles, and in the moments where we don't even realize that you're at work and you're continuing to work. In those times where we feel so far from you and you promise that you are close to us still. Always comforting. Always sufficient. Help us. Help us to be open. Whatever we go through, whatever we face, to be open to the work that you're wanting to do in us. Something good. Something good for us. Something good for our family. Something good for our community. Something good for the world. Help us to learn to trust you more and more. We ask it in Jesus' name.